Hmm, good day, Tragic here, and welcome to something a little bit new. I haven't done one of these in a long time. This is a Kickstarter demo. So basically, there's a Kickstarter called Horror on the Orange Express, the board game. It's still got six days to go. It's already made 1.6 million Australians, so it's easy to say this is pretty successful. It does have a lot of those Kickstarter things going on, like uh, the, ba the base game's kind of small, and then there's sort of non-compulsory and in inverted commas expansions that add more stuff to it. But uh, relative to some Kickstarters, it's quite small because it is still a traditional board game in the sense that it's cardboard chits mainly. And uh, some of you may know that the Horror on the Orient Express is a fantastic module for Call of Cthulhu, which is, in my opinion, the greatest RPG ever made. There's just nothing like it. Every single RPG on the planet is about turning the player into a god, and all the goodness in the world is coming from the external, and all the players are the morally questionable, or if they want to be the morally straight person, but the morals come from external gods-like sources. But in Call of Cthulhu, the players are the source of goodness and it's the outside universe that has the, well, not really evil, but just completely indifferent horribleness <laughs> crushing everything. Whatever. The point is, it's a really, and, and the players are like weak. Like, you know, you fall down a staircase the wrong way and call it Cthulhu, you will die. Like, we're, you're fragile. So it's like the opposite of that power experience. And it's just a fantastic, fantastic game. It's got the, and the whole mystery. Whatever, let's stop raving about Call of Cthulhu the RPG because we're talking about this board game. And the reason I mentioned the RPG is that the Horror on the Orient Express is one of the great campaigns for Call of Cthulhu. It's up there with Master of Nile of the Temp. And interestingly enough, it's my personal favorite game of, well, campaign of all time for Call of Cthulhu. Anyway, so this Kickstarter came out based on the game, so it's an instant buy for me. It's basically, this is a game that I bought to own it rather than to play it. Playing it's just a bonus. But if you click on the how to play button on the Kickstarter, you can download the rule book, which is here, which is, a, remember, this is all prototype. I'm pretty sure a lot of the iconography and the, the items aren't prototype. They, they, they're probably pretty close. All this stuff is probably pretty close to final, but, the rules is definitely prototype. That needs a lot of work at the moment. And also, if you click on play on TTS, it'll load you up and you can go straight and subscribe to the demo, which is what I'm going to be playing today. I have a quick look at this. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to do the setup and then I'll talk you through a little bit of it. And then in the next video, I'll do uh, I'll do a set of turns. So the first thing you do, now this is basically the, the default mod i haven't done anything really to it except i've imported this from the pdf and just brought this into the into the mod just so i have a because there's quite a lot of iconography in this game and it takes a little bit of getting used to and also just for my own benefit i just made a, a copy of a lot some of the tokens and placed them down here underneath the table and that just allows me to because in tts whenever anything's dropped into a bag it sort of deletes it from memory. And I was having some kind of weird, a few weird errors where things weren't loading correctly. So I just moved all the, every single token is now on the table. Nothing nothing is uh, loading, it's already preloaded. It seems to be working, the mod's working better for me now. But apart from that, it's just the default. So the first thing I'm gonna do is gonna click landscapes and that's gonna randomly choose us some landscapes from these piles here, okay? Now these, if I just click, draws them out. Now these things here, as the train moves through the dreamlands, they reveal these kind of tiles and they have events on them and they have portals that do summoning and all sorts of weird stuff, okay? And there's also uh, a couple of different start tiles. This is this start tile here. And this is this start tile here. I think this is the normal difficulty start tile and that is the hard, easy difficulty start tile. And if you look at the top of that tile, it tells you the kind of tiles that come out. So there's a, a three-turn tile, three-turn tile, three-turn tile, four-turn, five, five, blah, blah, blah. 
and you can see the numbers on the tiles here, right? Anyway, now we're going to click up to set up the cars and the passengers. So this is the train. This is the little model of the train, okay? We've already got the insane or possessed uh, driver. And you can have the curtains of the train can be open or closed. And if I do this click, it's going to boom. Couple of things, it's gonna draw out all these dice and this comes from this thing here, this is randomized. This tells you how the train is to be set up. Now all these sort of die, they're not to be rolled, they're basically just status indicators of random passengers. And they're over here, so they can be angry, panicked, happy, calm, insane, or wounded. I don't know why, but I, I, I always thought that was supposed to be possessed, but it's actually insane. So I've gotta stop saying possessed. Also, you might have noticed these sort of names for the carts came down. So these are, are randomized as well. So today we've got the first class is this one here, but later on it might be up here or whatever like that. Now it says click to set up suspects and clues. So over here we have a suspect pool and these are like named characters. And this reminds me of that game, Android. Do you remember Android, the original Android from FFG? Not the Android Netrunner, but the board game. Well, that had a suspect pool as well, which is a very similar idea to this, as in you are finding clues about these suspects and you're trying to determine whether they're cultists or not. All right? And they uh, have a number of different information here. We have sort of these... Uh, Where's the iconography? There we are. We have a feature token, we have desire tokens, and we have their ticket, like where they're going. And they've also got occult tokens, okay? Now, all the tokens are up here, and there's only a, a limited pool. So we can use this, we can knock things off here. In fact, I'm just gonna go, I'm just gonna grab a cube. And as, as, as we uh, play, and reveal these clues, we can actually turn this off. We can actually turn this, you know, knock these off and that can basically tell us what's available, you know? So it's, 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 a, it's a limited system it's a, to allow us to work things out. Anyway, so there the, we click that and it just sets up the suspects. And randomly flips them over. So each suspect has what they call favors, which is like this power. And when you use the favor, then it gets blocked out and you need to gain another favor for it to come back. So if I flip this over, you know, come back. Now, somewhere along here, there is another, here it is. Now, I think this is another randomized card. Basically, this is how you identify cultists. For starters, if they have the blood red fez, which is, I guess, you know, kind of like a tattoo or something, that means they're in the cult. So if you find that, they're instantly a cultist. Also, if they have a Constantinople train ticket, so they're going to Constantinople, or is it, is it Istanbul or Constantinople? Nobody knows but the Turks, eh? You have a Constantinople ticket of any type. You have a goblet and you do not have an elder sign, then you are a cultist. If you have four of any purple type, then you are a cultist. Now that's how we identify cultists. And this is how we win the game. We have to get to the end of here, like to turn to the last stop without dying from any other way and have all the cultists revealed. If we get to the end and survive all the way to the end, which, you know, it's probably rare because this is uh, my first time ever playing, and we actually identify someone as a cultist and they're not a cultist, or we miss a cultist, we still lose the game. Now, I'm not going to do this one. This is each player choose a color, but I'm going to play solo or four characters. So, boom, next. And this one is going to take from a random pool over here some extra customization for abilities and stuff. So, click. And out comes a little pull. Now, I'm not 
sure. I think this is actually the complete core set. So if you play this mod, you get exactly what's in the core set. Uh, there are, like I said, built-in expansions. So for example, the spell deck has got nine cards in it, at <laughs> 14 cards of items. Now coming from Arkham and Eldritch Horror, you're used to huge big stacks. So that's, uh, I'm pretty sure more stuff is gonna be added. Anyway, the point is we have now these abilities. So if we look at down at a character thing, first I'm just gonna put these guys in their car. So she starts in the Sanctuary car, which is this one here. He starts in the Salon, which is right up here. Oh, there's the Vampire. And she he starts in the first class compartment down here and she starts in the second class compartment which is up here all right let's have a quick look at the boards here so the way the boards work uh there's quite a lot of uh oh coffee oh awesome okay so basically the boards work on a cube action system very very common in board games i'm sure you know how this works if you do an action you just move the cube okay and then once you've done an action, or you can do you can do actions in any order, but you've got one cube action and then you've got two basic actions. And you can do two of the same basic action. The top ones are all standardized. And the, so there has like a space and then there's one at the bottom. That one is unique, okay? And these boards are dealt out to the players. Not sure if they're, I think they might be randomized as well. So you can separate the, I'm not quite sure, but uh, there's definitely, they definitely have this unique power. Like for her unique power, she can take calm passengers and turn them into happy passengers. The gunslinger here is like, he's got a very good ability called bounty hunt. He's basically our monster hunter. And each player has all these things down the side, right? These are all upgraded skills. So if I look at bounty hunt here, if you look at the top, Right hand side, you see like a diamond and then there's only one diamond, right? But if I go over to Bounty Hunt down here, you can see there's two. So that's the level two version of the Bounty Hunt. So you can upgrade these skills as well. And if you're actually upgrading these skills, that, that does it like this. So as you as you use your, your cubes, you will reveal these chevrons on on the board or sergeant stripes or upgrade stripes or whatever you want to call them the point is that when you take a rest action which is the white cube this moves all the cubes down and for every revealed chevron you get to activate one of the rest actions so you can upgrade skills you can learn new skills from your pool you can use your lucid skill which i'll talk about in a sec and you can restore energy so every time you use a cube it's free every time you use a basic action you use a stamina or an energy or whatever and that goes down so that's the timer now because you can do two actions basic actions this goes down a lot faster than your cubes so you kind of want to maximize your turns because you want to reveal at least two chevrons probably every single time you rest okay so that's basically the player boards but you'll notice that there is a spare slot slots. These are for getting new skills. And there's also the lucid skill and the special skill or, you know, whatever they call it. So if you come down here and you just pick these now, I don't know this game well enough. So I'm not, you know, this is literally my first time playing. So I don't know what skills are good. So there's a lot of things I don't know. Like I don't know all these passenger states, anything except happy, I assume is bad. Okay. Wounded is probably one of the worst states, I would imagine. And so would be insane. I don't understand the risks or the factors that make things risky. I don't understand the, the you know, the risks and the rewards in this game yet. So, like, I don't know how dangerous it is, how dangerous it is to have an angry passenger. Maybe that is, like, something I absolutely have to be on top of. Only experience will tell me. Why was I talking about that? Oh yeah, the reason I was talking about that is because there's a lot of these, a lot of these abilities, like say this one here, 
it calms down passengers, it changes their states, okay? And then you can move people who are calm or happy and stuff like that. So I don't really know what skills are good or bad. So I'm just basically going to random it. And the way I'm going to do that, I'm going to take the upgrade your one of your profession skills. That can't be bad. And I'm actually going to stick it on the gunslinger. And I'm going to upgrade to bounty hunt too. Nice. Now, because I don't really know what's good or bad, I'm going to take a conversation bag. I'm going to take an event bag. Okay, what is this one? So the way this works is there's two bags here, right? You've got the event bag and you've got the conversation bag. And you'll see how these work. These are similar to, say, Arkham Horror, the LCG. They're basically custom, fancy custom dice. There's no dice in this game. They use bags instead. These abilities drop things in. Okay, so I definitely want to take that one. I definitely want to take that one. That's an event that adds an event token that allows us to activate favors. So to flip these cards back into active. So that's nothing but good, I think. I'm not sure what this one does here. Uh, let me have a look. Nothing happens. Okay. That just basically means you get a free pull out of the bag. That's pretty cool. Or I could start, why don't I start with an artifact just so he can see artifacts. That I, re, I think this one's actually really good. So while I'm looking at these, what's, uh, what's this one here? Okay, I cannot seem to find anything in the manual visually where there's a picture of that icon for me to just go, I don't want to read it all right now. Should be on this page, but it doesn't seem to be. I think that is just a joker, I guess. Anyway, I'm going to take these three, okay? So add to conversation, add to the bag, and we'll take a artifact. So just draw an artifact, and these are a universal pull. So I'll put them up here. Any investigator can activate this. Lose a sanity, instead of drawing an event from the bag this turn, choose any one event from the discard pile. Not bad. And then we also get, of course, we get the new token. You know what? I think I'm actually gonna take, I'm gonna take the, the one that stops anything happening. So these blue tokens, these blue event tokens are like uh, instants. They get drawn and they instantly resolve and then you draw another one. The green event tokens, they are drawn, they instantly resolve, but then you don't draw another one. So we'll put that in the event bag, very, very nice. And then we'll take what I believe is a rant, is, a, is like a joker. So this counts for a, any conversation icon, I believe. So not that I've actually seen that in the manual. I'm just assuming, you know me, I never let the rules get in the way of having fun. Let's go. Okay, so now we all get to pick one of these things here, okay? So the way you read these cards is from top to bottom and they can resolve partially, okay? So costs always have to be spent, obviously, kind of like in a card game. But once you've spent the cost, the card text is activated and then you can resolve it partially. What have you got here? Let me try and get the terminology correct. What are these called? Feature clue. Okay, so this says, reveal a chosen feature clue of a given suspect in your carriage, right? Nice, very, very good. And that is the main goal of the game. So that's, uh, let's put that on the short list. Brawl, push zero, this is how you deal with monsters. So basically the train is flying through the dreamlands at a speed of one, and this can be upgraded to a speed of two, right? I don't know what that, maybe, you can't, maybe, maybe at some point you can't change the speeds. If the train ever slows down to zero and we like stop in the dreamlands, the monsters will just kill us. So the way, cause we're, you know, Call of Cthulhu, we're not running around with Tommy guns like Pulp Cthulhu. We can beat monsters by kind of pushing them out of the cart. We can throw people off the train 
and the speed is how fast they drop away from us. So if we push this monster and he goes off the end of the train, he goes back into the pool, right? And that's called pushing. So it's basically an attack. So killing monsters sounds like a good thing. Fast top five is good. Disguise. If you're in a carriage with closed curtains, change places with a chosen suspect and immediately take another main action. Okay, that's cool. So that is a free move. And what's more importantly is normally to move, you have to use a basic action, which takes energy. But this one takes a cube, which will increase the chances of revealing a third chevron before you run out of energy. So I really like that, a free move. That sounds good to me. This is another combat. So this is called banish. So banish is different to push. This one says, if you're in a carriage with an open window, banish all monsters from a chosen carriage that is behind your carriage. So basically, the way I, the way I envision this is that if, if we're here and it's got an open window, we lean out the window and we like shoot our guns down the side of the train, okay? Now banish is different to push. So push is, is pushing them off and they go back into the pool. But banish sends them down to limbo down here. Just gonna turn off. Some of these tool tips are really annoying. There we are. They, they go down to limbo down here. And when the, when the event stack resolves, okay, so what happens, you draw out events and they placed over here and cover these events, okay? So whatever the event showing, like, so if I draw this card, draw this one, so if I draw this card, right? See how it's got two pips? It goes in the two pip slot here, Lamo. Okay, so when the event stack resolves now, it's gonna activate this one instead of the monster one underneath it. But the event stack doesn't resolve until there are three filled slots, okay? Any three slots out of the four. And then once it's resolved, every time you resolve, you pull off the token and place it up here into the discard pile, whatever. The point is the very last action on the event thing is that all the monsters in the, in the, the void here end up back at the final carriage. What that basically means is this thing here, if we have a guy standing here with this window open, he can basically just banish all the monsters constantly. So we might be able to really control the monsters very well with that one. I actually prefer this one to the other combat one, Brawl. So that's the third one. Got a Fast Talk 5 and Intimidate. So this says, send one passenger of any status or a suspect to a chosen carriage. Now it doesn't really say it in this thing, but you gotta take it as read that it's always talking about the carriages you are in, okay? So when it says any suspect or any cat passenger, like if I'm the chemistry professor, it means only these two, passengers or the comic book writer guy. Okay, it doesn't mean anywhere on the train. And I may spend two energy to send another one to the same carriage. So for example, if I had that one, I could send this guy to say the first class compartment and for two energy, I could also send the comic book writer. Now this is important. This doesn't seem good, but I think it is actually good because Basically, when I was reading the manual, it talks about these things called desires. So these green things here are desires, okay? Now, a couple of them are revealed at the beginning of the game. For example, we've revealed this desire here. And the desire in this says, this suspect desires to be in the locomotive. So when we send, where the hell's his name? Oh, when we send Sullivan, it's on, when we send Sullivan, if Sullivan is ever in the locomotive, this will resolve. And when this resolves, we reveal all his tokens and we find out whether he's a cultist. And if I look over at the other ones here, they're a double-sided card where you can either be 
a bad thing as a cultist or a good thing as a, you know, a good boy. And a lot of these things, like, uh, for example, this one says he wants to be in the locomotive. Other ones will say this one desires a grimoire. Uh, this suspect desires to be in a carriage with another suspect that has an active favor. So my point is moving around the suspects is probably a good thing. So I'm actually, I actually think that's good. Talk five is also very, very good, I would imagine. So these are the ones I'm taking. Okay, so what have you got here? Well, this guy here is going mainly going to be killing people. I think I'm going to give him the, the, the free move one. I'll give intimidate to whoever this person. Oh, I'll give I'll, yeah, I'll give it to him. Uh, who's down here? That's the millionaire boy. Who the hell's the millionaire boy? Okay, so the player figures millionaire boy. They're linked to the action, the the basic action card. So that's millionaire boy. So I'm going to give millionaire boy the firearms because he's already down this side of the carriage spot hidden i'll give that to the chemistry professor and i'll give intimidate to the preacher what well, sounds about right finally we have these lucid skills these are basically unique actions that we can take in during your rest oh yeah i forgot to say see how that says push zero the reason I said that zero, I, I was trying to talk about this before, that means it adds one to your speed. So if this is at speed two, that is actually push two. So your push zero plus the speed of the train. So that's push one to get off the train. Or if I pushed him, it would end up in behind this one here. Okay, all everywhere restores two. I like that one. That's going to allow people to gain their chevrons easier because they'll get another turn to put a cube out. So I quite like that. Probably have diminishing returns by the end of the game though. This is another movement one. Send a passenger of, of any status from your carriage to a chosen carriage. Move one swirly thing from a portal. Uh, what are these swirly things called? Essence token. Okay, so the way that works is this game has a sort of similar thing, I guess, to Eldritch Horror, where there's like an activation sequence that activates all the all the tiles, and it's based on how many essences are on them. Well, the essences do things, right? So if there's no essences on that portal, it won't trigger. So removing essences is very important, and it's very important because we have an actual we have an actual uh, limit there's 24 essences here right and when we run out of essences like if we ever have to draw an essence and there are no essences the game is instantly lost it's one of the ways we can lose the game so removing them from here not only means that all these really bad effects can't trigger it also stops the game from ending so i think that's a really good one what else we got Another push. I mean, that's not bad. Why not? And so this is an insane to wounded. So wounded is worse than insane, I guess. We can change angry and calm. We can talk to happy or panicked. We got anything that deals with da, da 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 da. We don't have anything on any of our characters that seems to deal with insane passengers. So let's take that one as well. Ooh, that one's really good. Gather an investigator from anywhere to your carriage. That's basically like an even better version of this other move thing that I got. Where did I get that? Okay, well, these are the ones I'm going to take. Boom. 
We'll give this one to you, I guess. Restore everywhere. We'll give that to you. Uh, I'll give a push there. And we'll give this one to you. Okay, so that is that done. So everyone set up, click. We're going to do normal difficulty. And I think that what happened then is that it randomly chose one of these tokens to put in the bag. Boom. And we're done. I'm just going to lock all these. And now we are ready. To oh, wait. I forgot to tell you <laughs> about this vampire guy. So not only do you have the monsters chasing the train, on the train itself, I'm just going to change this. Like I keep forgetting about it because it's so hard to see. So I'm just going to tint this like a bright pink just so I can see him. Okay. So basically, you have this vampire figure hanging on the side of the train. Kind of cool. Very nice. Okay, whatever. The point is, we actually saw one of his tokens before. Now, the bag automatically shuffles when you draw things from it or place things in it, I think. Yeah. So let's just search. Here's a vampire token. When this triggers, the vampire activates. Now the vampire basically, you just run through this board and do whatever the first one to activate is. So for example, he is currently in this carriage. It has the doors closed, which means that he's more powerful at night. So obviously there's, these, there's a row here and there's a row here. And when something activates, he gets more power, powerful, right? So... For example, at the moment, he kills wounded people. Let's get rid of that tooltip. But he only wounds panicked people during the day, during open carriages. He kills them at night. But if that happens, you then take this off and see now he's more powerful. He always kills the panicked people. And that's the way that works. So I don't know whether there's anything that directly affects him or whether he's always going to be on this cart. But the point is we basically want to open these windows so he's not so powerful while he's there. I'm not quite sure whether you can push the vampire. I'll have to... Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, okay. So over here, these are the monsters. Let's uh, just turn off these tooltips. I always turn off tooltips because I like to look at the... So I like to look at the, the component Often I'm reading by moving my mouth like this and then the tooltip's right where I'm trying to read. I have asked uh, the mod, the mod author, the, the act, not the mod author, the people who make Tabletop Simulator to have an option to detach the tooltip from the mouse cursor and have it appear like up in the top corner or down here or something. Anyway, whatever. The monsters have a pretty basic AI system. You've seen this all the time. It's very, very common. One of the first games I saw really go to town with these AI systems was Galaxy Defenders, which is a personal favorite of mine. And the way this works is that you just start at the top and activate whatever is available. Okay, so this guy here, the Reaver, it says if he is by a carriage with passenger of any status, all investigators, see how, okay, so... <laughs> That really confused me when we started when I when I first read the rules. So basically, suspect is a box, investigator is a circle. Raving investigator basically means insane, but raving isn't as being insane isn't as bad as it is in some of these games. If you're raving, you're actually much better at casting spells, which is awesome. Anyway, what was I saying? I was talking about something. Oh yeah, I was talking about the monsters. And then in the carriage, a happy person gets hurt. Otherwise, if there's no happy person, any person gets killed. Okay, so this guy's bad. And then if that can't trigger, then it'll do this one. And if that can't trigger, then it'll just do this one. This is reduce the train speed by one. Very, very bad. So there's the monster abilities there. And finally... There is the actual event event itself. 
So I believe this is also randomized. So somewhere in this bag, here it is, is a token that activates the event. And when it activates, you put these ritual tokens down here. So these are what the cultists are doing. The cultists themselves are you know, doing crazy stuff on the train. We don't want this to resolve. We don't want this board to resolve too much. It's got its own deck of cards. It's got its own things going on. And uh, we can spend tokens to stop it. Bad thing that happened there. And I'm pretty sure this, it's sort of like, it's sort of like the uh, goo powers in Eldritch Horror or Arkham Horror that sort of modify the game state. That's another one of these. I'm pretty sure that this this is Crazy Train is what's in the mod, but I'm I would be very surprised if there isn't a deck of these uh, rituals. Okay, so that is basically all we have to do to start the game. We can start playing now, but I just want to quickly talk about what is happening. Horror on the Orient Express is a gigantic campaign, RPG campaign. It goes for, I mean, if you want to play that campaign, you're looking at like three to five years of regular game sessions to get through it. Same for Nalothotep's even bigger. I mean, I know people have played that one game for like six years. Now, when they introduced the, I think it was the second edition, it wasn't in the original version of Horror on the Orient Express, but there's a kind of sub-module in Horror on the Orient Express, which is sort of like this sub-campaign where you have this all about the dreamlands. And much of this game is taken from that campaign, which is a really great idea because that campaign could actually be ignored. Like you don't have to run that campaign at all inside the Horror on the Orient Express. I don't know why you wouldn't because it's awesome, but that means that this mod is taking a lot of its cues from that sort of sub campaign which leaves most of the story from the horror on on the orient express completely free for later and you know because there's no way they could fit it all into the game there is a there is an expansion that they've added somewhere here we are there's an expansion called consumed by the void this is actually a campaign mode right comes with its own detective but I am fairly certain that this campaign mode will be much more story driven. The version I'm playing is kind of like Arkham Horror second edition where it's just sort of random events you try and get through. So it's probably the version I'm going to play the most because I like emergent storytelling because I find that narrative based board games become a bit stale. But I'm pretty sure more of the RPG is going to be visible inside this campaign mode. But basically in the Dreamlands sub campaign of Orient Express, right? There's like this sort of ghost sort of conductor and he was a, you know, a fledgling wizard. And the reason why the Orient Express is so luxurious is because he had this spell that would send the passengers into the dreamlands when they slept. And in the dreamlands, they would fulfill their fantasies and all this kind of stuff. And they'd wake up all refreshed and beautifully happy right and that's why everyone was so you know why the orient express was so opulent and, and awesome but of course as things go things go bad and the train ends up being so basically everyone when they fall asleep in the campaign you can do it all in one lot or you can do it in bits would be transported to this train flying through the dreamlands but of course it wasn't a dream they're actually in the dreamlands and now it's gone haywire and they're just rocketing through the dreamlands, you know, out of control through this mystical railway. And uh, it's bad. So that's basically the premise of this game is taken from that part of the campaign. But there's other aspects that are also not in that thing, like the vampire and all this kind of stuff. So that's basically the setting, though. So the idea is that the train itself is being sucked through into the dreamlands, which is like the... It's like a parallel universe kind of thing. And yeah, that's that's that. So I'm pretty sure, I think I'm done. I think I'm done for video one. So next video, I will get into the actual gameplay. Now remember, I have not played this game. This is a complete blind playthrough, so don't expect great turns. And I'll try and uh, not make mistakes, but you know, just, just remember, don't watch my videos as rules explanations, even though I just spent like 40 minutes explaining the rules. See you guys next time.